Starting now on Book TV's Afterwards program, journalist Rachel Louise Snyder reports on the intersection of domestic violence and other social issues impacting American society. She's interviewed by Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell of Michigan. Afterwards is a weekly interview program with relevant guest hosts interviewing top nonfiction authors about their latest work. Well, I'm Debbie Dingell, Congressman from 12th District of Michigan, and I'm really happy to be here with Rachel Louise Snyder, who I hope it's okay if I just call you Rachel, and please I'm Debbie. Do. Yes, please do. Thank you. And we're here, we're going to talk about your book, No Visible Bruises, which I read over this weekend. And it's a hard subject for me, so I'm going to tell you that as we begin this dialogue. And I suspect they asked me if I would talk to you or interview you on C-SPAN because it's a subject that I've talked about more in the last uh, couple of years. But it's still a hard subject, I think, mm -hmm. for anybody to talk about. Why did you write this book? Because it was hard for people to talk about. Um, because I, w I was a foreign correspondent, I, I did stories, social and humanitarian issues around the world for two decades and moved back to America in 2009 and uh, learned about, learned actually through a, f a sister of a friend about this program that was working on preventing domestic violence homicide by predicting it, which, I mean, just sounded like science fiction to me. I just, I was like, how can you do that? And uh, so I, I ended up learning about that program, which was really just the tip of the iceberg. And then the other, like the other piece of that was learning how out of view it was, like how much it intersects with all these other social and humanitarian crises, really, that we face in this country and around the world. And nobody was talking about it. I mean, really, apart from the, the headline that said, you know, estranged husband kills wife self, which you see every day in this country, nobody was doing any kind of deep dive into this as a social issue. And as a writer, I don't think we always know what what topics grab us. Um, but this one just grabbed me, and I thought, you know, I look, I looked at my little daughter, and I thought, here's my little attempt to make the world better for you. Um, it just it it. it it runs across the gamut of, of you know, economics, race, culture, gender, um, and intersects with, um, with a lot of problems, but we can actually do something about it. That was the other thing. Well, let's, um, let's talk about the book a little. Um, you divided it. Well, there, I'm, there are several things that I want to bring out. Mm -hmm. um, you divided it into sort of three sections, or you sort of, um, you first talked about uh, why do people stay, mm -hmm. and I want you to talk about that in a minute, but I also, it, as I was reading the book, I thought about, tr you made a decision that you were going to call people survivors, which, by the way, I think that anybody who works in uh, this field has decided we don't we should not call people victims that there mm -hmm. are people that survive So I was glad to see you do that, but you also decided to refer to them as she mm -hmm. and I'm super sensitive because I Get a little more courage to talk about this. There are men that have been domestically abused But for purposes of this book. Yeah, you you decided to do that But you know, all the children that mm -hmm. are in these situations are also often survivors mm -hmm. as you say so Maybe we could talk a little about that first section first because people do get this attitude. Why do people stay? They don't understand yeah. it. Yeah, I know. And I, honestly, if I could dispel one question from the conversation, it would be that question. Why does she stay? Right? It's always gendered, of course. Um, no one asks, why, why is that person hitting his or her spouse in the first place? Like, that seems like a better question to ask. But... Um, People stay for all sorts of reasons, and they also don't stay, right? We just don't know. Part of the point of my book is we don't know what leaving looks like. So there's there's a woman in the book, for example, um, who didn't have – her name was Michelle. Her husband was named Rocky, and then they had their two kids. And there wasn't – neither of their family saw physical evidence of violence um, against her in the in the decade or so that they were together. 
But he would do, do, do things like, um, he would say to her, I know your family hates me. It's so uncomfortable for me to, to, to go spend holidays with them. I don't want to, you know, and she would feel then out of loyalty and what a marriage requires to go to his family's house, right? That's how it sort of began. And then when she would do something that would upset him, he would take the kids and he would go camping for the night or he'd go to a motel for the night. And she'd be frantic with worry. Um, eventually, towards the end, he would do things like he went up to um, an area outside, on the outskirts of the city where they lived in Montana, and he got a rattlesnake, and he brought it home and kept it in a cage. And he would say to her, I'm going to put this in your bed with you, or I'm going to put this in the shower with you if you, you know, get out of line. And so it kept her complicit. So, you know, where is someone like that supposed to go? She could go to a shelter, but that's temporary, right? And she can't she can't raise her kids in a shelter. She could go out of state, but at some point he's going to call the authorities and say, hey, I think my kids have been kidnapped, right? I mean, where is she physically going to be able to go? And so in her case, she was leaving him, and she was making very quiet sort of secret steps to be able to leave him. So one thing she had done is put the house in her name. The house was owned by her father, and they rented it, and she and her father had arranged to secretly put it in her name so they could get Rocky out of there. She was in school to get a nursing degree. Rocky wouldn't let her work outside the home, um, but he would let her take classes. So she was trying to take classes to be able to afford to, to raise her kids. So they leave, but leaving is a long, long process. You know, many people don't. Um a lot of women stay, but there's so many, it's complicated. You, 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 you are correct about the um, economic reasons and that people don't know how they're going to live. And we've got a real problem in this country that we don't have affordable housing. So there's not a place that they can go that they can afford and that they're going to be safe. Mm -hmm. But frequently, they're made to feel that their children are, th their children are used as actual tools against them, that yeah. they won't support them or uh, d d d what are you going to do? Right. Uh, how do, and people don't understand the toll that it takes on children right. as well. Right. Um, and that's one of the things that we need to talk about more, I think, as well. I mean, I want to just say one thing about the economics, um, and, then, and then we can talk about the children, is that um, there's, there's a woman in Washington, D.C. named Peg Haxelow who started something called the, I think it's called the Survivor Resilience Fund. And she did a lot of research, and she found that, in fact, a lot of survivors have jobs and can afford to raise their kids. I mean, in, in, in the book, in the case of Michelle, she, she did not have a job. But, um, and what they have is just a money crunch, like a one-time money crunch. Like they can't come up with the, you know, first, first and last month's rent and security deposit on a new place. Or their, their abuser has run up their credit card bill and they've, they've got bad credit now. Like, like they need just sort of a chunk of money to get past that hurdle. Um, that to me was a sort of new innovation that I hadn't heard of until I was working on the book that like sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, they don't need housing, they don't need whatever, they need um, a chunk of money. So I think that the part of that points to just how... Um, how many different scenarios there are and how different, you know, d it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, I thought I found that really interesting because I think the narrative we hold in our head is, is this one particular type of victim, right? So I, not everybody does just because I lived in a household that, mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons that I have agreed. Greed's not the right word. My mother's alive and it's still hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it took me a long time to admit that there had been incidences in our home. But in those days, the police didn't respond. The night that I remember the most vividly, when my father took all the doorknobs off, and um, it, 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 30 years ago, the police didn't even respond. I mean, one of the things you talk about here is how law enforcement is becoming more trained mm -hmm. uh, to know how to respond and when to respond and to recognize it. But it, it is not one size fits all. It is. Yeah. It happens in every household across every demographic. And it's something that 
we have to talk about more, which is why I, I said to you at the beginning, why did you write this book now? And I was surprised when you, it's only been out about a week or 10 days. Yeah. And that the response to this has been overwhelming. Has been yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. You know, there are two other sort of parts of the book. You talk about strangulation and then you talk about um, the activists and people that are out at the forefront. That's my word. But people that are at the forefront of change. But you talk about guns. Yeah. And um, I suspect one of the reasons that I was asked to interview you today is that I have I was one of the uh, strongest advocates for the Violence Against Women Act in the House. Mm-hmm. which we did pass, but we had a provision in there that would uh, that closes the loophole that someone had mm-hmm. been convicted if they were in a relationship, not married, but had been a partner and were convicted of domestic violence right. and or stalking, that they wouldn't be able to have access to a gun. Now uh, the Senate is looking at the Violence Against Women Act and that provision's in there. Talk about guns and their presence in the home. Boy. Debbie, how much time have you got? I know. <laughs> no, it's why I asked you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but guns are, um, it's, it's almost impossible to overstate their, their effect in a situation like this. You know, guns are, of course, guns are the most common weapon used in domestic violence homicides. But even, even leaving that aside... Guns are um, used as a, as a visual threat over and over. I talked to a woman whose father used to just go like this, right, with the gun on the table. And then when he was done doing this, he just had all these guns on the wall hung like art. You know, just as a reminder, they were all loaded. <laughs> they were all ready to be used at any moment. Um, and that man eventually shot his daughter in the head, and she survived am- amazingly. Um, and then he, he killed himself in, in jail. Um, guns are also, you know... Um, Pro-gun groups will say, well, you know, victims need to arm themselves. And there's, there's really no research. There's anecdotes, but there's no research that backs that victims are safer when they arm themselves. It just means there's an extra gun in the house for an abuser to get hold of. I mean, they're so problematic, so problematic. And children to have access to. Children to have be. access. I mean, I just, um, I, can't, I can't say this enough, and I have these arguments in my own family, um, so I'm familiar with how hard it is for you being out there to try to get the message across. But, I, you know, we don't, we don't become safer in our homes when there are guns in the homes. And, the, you know, the other thing, to me, one of the, one of the strongest arguments um, about not having guns in the home is that when you are asking a victim to have a gun to protect themselves, you are asking that victim to embody the the sort of somatic experience of an abuser, right? To say, oh, well, you need to become violent in order to counteract that violence. And it's, it's just not a natural stance for, for many people. Um, and to me, that's, that's, that's a, a really strong argument. I'm psychologically not that person. I can't do that. You know, I, and I'm, I'm so sorry for interrupting, but it, your house had evidence of violence in it, right? Your house had violence in it. My house um, didn't have any kind of the the stories that I write about in the book, but there were times when, as a teenager, my father was violent or I was violent toward my father. I was a very angry kid. I would never have been able to pull a gun on my father because I also love him, you know? I just, I think that that is not a realistic response. No, in the book you call domestic violence terrorism. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah. You know, domestic violence, it's first of all just an abstraction. It's just an abstract term. But apart from that, it doesn't get at the, the kind of mindset of living in fear all the time. You know, there's a reason that, that the neurological makeup of a domestic violence victim is is the same as the neurological makeup of a prisoner of war, right? Their their brain scans mimic each other because you're living in anticipation of violence. And that's what terror is. I mean, I know that we have a lot of associations to terror in this country <laughs> that are different, and so that word is problematic in certain ways. But in terms of the anti- anticipated violence and the fear, 
that's what it is. I've heard there's a couple of women in Canada who are trying to get the word torture written into their domestic violence laws. And I think, I think that that is an apt word too. Torture. It is torture. So, oh, I, mean, I could, th- these kinds of situations are yeah. so complicated. Yeah. Why do you think, I mean, you talk about this in the book, why do perpetrators abuse? Why, what is built into their DNA or what social situation causes them to abuse? And how do we address that? And how do we take that on now? I love that you're asking the small questions, Debbie. (laughs) Well, no, but it comes right up at the beginning of the book. Absolutely. You can't write a book about domestic violence and not address that um, in some way. And I think that, first of all, I think that that is as the answers to that are as complicated as the solutions to domestic violence, which is that there are a lot of different reasons. Um, We have in our heads, I think, this idea of um, like a monster. Someone will recognize on the street, we'll know if that person is violent. And that's, that's ridiculous. I, I, you know, I have four brothers and I can't, I don't, I think I can recognize different types of men from my, my four very different brothers. And it's just not, it's just not true. Only about a quarter of batterers fit that rageaholic, you know. Um, Domestic violence, and I, that term is problematic, but I'm going to use that because we understand what it means or we, we have a, a common consensus, um, is really not about, about rage as it is about anger and control, right? I say in the book, researchers say, look, these perpetrators know how to act in the rest of society. I mean, they're, they're not raging at their job. They're not beating up their coworkers. It's one particular person or set of people in their home. That is, that is the object of that, of that control. And in some sense, I had someone say to me once, and it really, it, it sort of blew my mind. He said, you know, domestic violence is really um, a paradox because the abusers are both in and out of control. They are, they are controlling their partners or their family, but they're also out of control in that, in that sense. And they are um, unable to access like the world of, of Emotions. I mean, they, he said to me, this Neil Websdale in, in Arizona said, you know, their partners are the conduit to the emotional world that they can't inhabit. And I thought that was, I thought that gave me a different frame to think about them. Not every situation's the same. And not ever, you know, we, you have people that take pills, you have people that drink, they have their behavior can be driven or triggered by something. Uh, young people who have grown up in an abusive d- situation tend to, if we don't do some kind of intervention, mm-hmm. tend to repeat it. Um, I had a baby sister who ultimately died of a drug overdose, but uh, she um, she met someone actually in, I don't talk about this as much, so if I was in interviewing you, I would never be talking about this, mm. but I think we need to tell people sometimes about this, but she had met him in an AA kind of mm-hmm. session on her drug treatment. And, you know, some people have low self esteem, and somebody pays attention, they end up married. But he used to hit her and he manipulated her both emotionally and physically. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you tried to, she'd ask for help, but she was very dependent on him, as many people are in these situations. And, Ultimately, he broke every bone in her face oh. and uh, called in. I said, Mary, I can't do anything. You've got to call the police yourself. So she did call the police. They arrested him. We've changed the law. Laws vary from state to state. Sure. You talk about that in this book as well. Mm-hmm. But she went back the next morning and didn't press charges and, you know, took him home. That gets back to why do women stay? And yeah. there are a variety of different situations. And sometimes people have low self-esteem. They don't think anybody else loves them. They're desperate for companionship. Mm-hmm. I don't. Their sense of self has been eroded. You know, Michelle in the book, who was killed by Rocky, ultimately, um, she weighed about 100 pounds when she was killed. And he used to call her fat all the time. He used to say, you know, you're so fat, you're fat. B, you're this, that, that really corrodes like one sense of self. I mean, 
You know, one of the things I think it's so important because we, when we stand on the outside, even you as the sister, you can stand on the outside and say, I'm, I'm thinking rationally, why doesn't she do this, this, and this, right? And the metaphor that I use in the book is if you're out hiking and a bear comes at you, you don't stop and think, hmm, what are, what are the resources in nature available to me to, to get out of this situation? You have no time to think, no time, right? That bear is coming at you. All you can do is think, run, or hide, or play dead, or whatever. And then, what if that bear isn't coming at you, but is coming at your children, right? So I think in that kind of situation, I don't, I don't know what you're like, but I know in an emergency, I am not who you want to be around. I remember with my now ex-husband, he's a retired British commando, and he, we were whitewater rafting. He popped out one time. And my first reaction, my first reaction, I'm holding the thing, and I go, oh, no, nothing. I don't try and help him back in. I don't try, you know, and it's other people in the boat who are like, let's get him back in. I was like, oh, yes, yes, let's get him back in. That's, that's just how I am in an emergency. I just freeze. And I think, you know, that is the sustained, like, neurological hardware of a victim. They feel that all the time, all the time. There's a, there's a, a, a program here in D.C. through D.C. Safe that was fascinating when I heard this. This woman, Natalia Otero, started it, and she said, you know, um, when, we, when we walk into an emergency situation... We ask, what do you need for the next 24 hours? Do you need diapers? Do you need formula? Do you need a gift card to the grocery store to get some food? Do you need, you know, a hotel room for one night? And she said, it's amazing how if you can just clear up those basic needs for 24 to 48 hours, victims are in a much better position to make long-term decisions. And I just, I was amazed by the many, many you know, they're not solutions, but they are sort of solutions that don't take that much for change to, to make a real difference. Um, that's a long, sort of a long-winded answer, but I think these things are complicated, you know? They're complicated, and not everybody can, a quick intervention that gives somebody for a helping hand for a day or two helps many of the situations. So sure. every situation is different. Right. But let me ask you this, if you've learned, how do you, so one of the the incident in which ultimately uh, was a su- suicide, mur- murder, suicide, uh, th- that people didn't recognize that there was abuse going on. But when you went back and put the picture together, mm-hmm. uh, people did. How do people recognize? How do you help recognize that someone's in an abusive a situation? What's the role of somebody who thinks that there may be an abusive situation? Is it anybody's business? I mean, I actually think it is, but some people think it's not. Yeah. And how do you really help somebody? What's the best way you help somebody that you think is in an abusive situation? Um, again, with such small questions, Debbie. <laughs> I know. I think I do this I, a lot. I spent the weekend at Safe House, so yeah. It's... This is. I mean, this is. These are complicated issues. So the first thing I think is. We started off this conversation by saying this is difficult to talk about. I think the first thing is to acknowledge it's difficult to talk about, but then to, to still talk about it. I think, you know, as a, as a journalist and as someone who interviews people, I've gotten used to, to probing a little bit. And I said, I was asked this at a reading the other night. A woman said, I've, I have a friend who I suspect is in an abusive relationship. What can I do? And I said, okay, here's a, here's a tactic that interview, that, that journalists will sometimes do repeat their own language back to them and it forces them to go deeper right so you if you were to say to me you know we had some incidents in my house when i was growing up i might say incidents what kind of incidents in your house right and you're sort of forced to to go deeper so that's the first thing is to excavate that a little bit because very often victims will say things like well you know things are a little rough at home right and that doesn't you don't know how to gauge that. So I think the first thing is to find out a little bit more about what's going on. Um, If you really suspect that there's something happening in someone's house, I would give them the Danger Assessment website. It's just dangerassessment.org. And it's a 20-question questionnaire that is um, uh, the 20 highest risk indicators of domestic violence homicide. Um, 
and you, if you're an advocate, you can actually get training on how to how to look at those questions because they're weighted. But if you're a victim and you just want a, a snapshot, that's another, that's one thing I would do. There are apps that are actually connected on that same website that you can download on your phone. And if you click the app, it will call either the police, you can program it however you want, or, if, or a friend, trusted person who will then call the police on your behalf. And the app automatically switches to like Spotify or something so that if an abuser takes someone's cell phone, there's no record of that, of the police being called. Um, and then the other thing I would do is is that I think we have to recognize that a lot of situations, people are talking to others. They don't call the police. They don't go to treat, seek out to emergency medical help, but they may go talk to their clergy, right? Or they may talk to um, coworkers. And so in some ways, I feel like just awareness and education for those populations is another answer. And then, of course, there's policy changes we can make. What do you think some of those policy changes are that we need to make? Well, guns, 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 and guns, of course. I mean, you're making some of these policy changes already, closing the boyfriend loophole. Um, I do think that we could create a national database of stalking so that people could share across state borders because, you know, a lot of what, com- what, what, what works in these situations comes down to communication, and it's communication across bureaucracies. Um, and I think, I think resources, this, is, is, this may be as policy in terms of violence against women, but I think resources for um, uh, men are, are needed, resources for LGBTQ, um, resources for any sort of non-heteronormative population. I think we need to create a safe space for those people as well. Well, one of the things I read in the book, and I guess I intellectually knew this or sort of, but the book focused me on it this weekend, is that, I mean, I know that different states have different laws, but that in some instances, if someone's been convicted of a misdemeanor mis, motion, <laughs> she talked today, <laughs> that it will be, uh, it, it's not, it will be dropped. The record won't show in the record. Yeah. And then when law enforcement is responding to a situation, they don't have the history of right. the previous conviction. Right. Did you, I mean, would you suggest that there be something nationally that, that has to be available? I think that's a great idea. In, in Montana, one of the suggestions they made, um, so, so most states, all but three or four states, have what's called the fatality review team. And those fatality review teams look at certain domestic violence homicides in their states to try to figure out where gaps could be closed. Um, some teams are more effective than others, and Montana is, is pretty effective. And their team, one of the things they talked about was um, keeping those those misdemeanor charges permanent in a database in the same way that DUIs are permanent in that state. And so, yeah, I think that's a great idea because the thing that is, that one of the points in the book that is so important is, we actually need to be getting domestic violence when it's in the misdemeanor stage before it goes into a felony, right? Otherwise, we have no chance of of keep, keeping somebody safe. You know, this is a complicated uh, question, as you were just talking about the intervention. Um, and that is, you know, we've seen some of these horrific videos of, sports players, you know, beating their wives and dragging them onto elevators or some other public way, hitting them. Um, people get drunk and there's an incident. You call the police. Um, it becomes public, but they want to work at fixing the marriage or fixing what's broken. And people say, well, why do you stay? Some people, it, it finally is the camel the, or the straw that broke the camel's back. Or, mm. And some people are still scared to death and don't know how they're going to survive. So they, what is that delicate balance between, and it's a delicate balance. Mm-hmm. When should somebody stay? When does treatment work? How do, what's the difference between rehabilitation? What, what, what should the legal system be doing in terms of, I found myself struggling with this. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. find myself saying some days, why did you stay? Why did you make us? Can, when do we, when do, I mean, we could also talk about how you help young people in situations like that right. and when the intervention happens. But what is that fine line between rehabilitation, getting mental health treatment, 
and using the legal system to make sure that you're protecting the survivors and mm -hmm. holding someone accountable. I mean, I think that um, it, it, I'll try to unpack that a little bit because, first of all, I think survivors, we do need to give them agency to make decisions on their own. And in many cases, they don't, as I think I said this already, they don't want the relationship to end. They just want the violence to stop, right? They love this person. I mean, love, we haven't talked about love, um, but love is a big part of this, right? I mean, love is is a complicating factor in these relationships, right? I mean, or if, they think they love someone. Or they, th or they think they love someone. Maybe they do, maybe they think it, whatever the reason is. Um, so I think one thing is that the, they sort of have to answer, even in the abstract, what is acceptable. Like, is it acceptable for him to sometimes lose his cool and yell at me? Like, okay, I can live with that, all right? Or for her to sometimes lose her cool and yell at me. Um, I think that, that we need to, to separate anger management from batterer's intervention because they're very different things. Anger management tends to be 12 weeks. It's like someone who has, you know, a, an anger problem sitting in traffic or something like that. Batterer's intervention is a, a much different, if it's effective, um, and there's questions about its efficacy, but if it's effective, it's much longer. It's a much deeper dive. It has only, not not only components of accountability from the abuser's standpoint, but gender education, right? I, I've sat in on a lot of batterer's intervention, and it's amazing to me, um, particularly this one group of guys that I sat in on, they were, like, stunned to learn that they had been shaped by more than just their own idea of who they thought they should be as men, that they were shaped by society's forces or cultural forces, um, telling them that their their gendered expectations are, you know, are something other than what they thought they had formed. I mean, some of it is really, truly just just gender education and then also giving a skill set of what to replace those behaviors with. You can't just say, recognize how intimidating you look, recognize when you're, you know, losing control or whatever. Here are some alternative skills that you might think of. I talked to one guy who uh, said that when he learned what his body looked like in a moment of rage, like he would... His fist would um, pump and his muscles would, you know, clench and he would he would get big and his voice would get deep and he would step, like step toward his his girlfriend, you know, in this intimidating way. And he said once he realized what he looked like sitting in on this batterer's intervention group, all he did was take a step backwards instead of forward. Like just that simple sort of thing that snaps him out of that moment. I thought I found that fascinating. And it's free. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's good. I think there's also the question of how do you help young men and women who have been brought up in this situation um, 30 years ago, people. I, I still think there's a great deal of stigma attached to it. Absolutely. Too Absolutely. many, you know, the, the survivors think I've done something wrong. What mm -hmm. have I done wrong? I deserve this. Uh, 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 um, it's my fault. It's yeah. my fault. There's, yeah. Yeah. It's very. But, and then young men who see their fathers act like that think that that's the role they're supposed to play. They're domineering. They're bullies. Women think they have to be submissive. Mm -hmm. I was. I, I, do, I do a fair amount of work with the different shelters or in organizations in, in Michigan, and um, I have to give kudos to the uh, Arab American community, uh, Access, which is now trying to address this issue within the Arab American community, which is obviously uh, traditionally a male um, uh, dominant. dominant. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. trying not to use that word, but it is. So, uh, mm -hmm. but it was when I was in her. I really got upset when I was in this room, and some of the I don't want to give away any confidentiality, etc. But people were feeling. What would their family say? That they, they didn't yeah. want to bring the embarrassment down upon their children. It and yet these kids' lives were being threatened. That's one of the things, and they also didn't think they had any options, but as they were telling these stories, these young children were, their lives were in danger. Mm -hmm. And so how do you help, you know, give support? And then to see the young children being raised in that situation, to know, I mean, I thought that, that I mean, mine was, you know, every situation's different. I had a father who was an opiate drug addict before anybody knew when, you know, his moods right. would shift. I thought that was normal. And right. many people 
think those kinds of mood swings or that kind of anger is normal. Mm -hmm. How do we help schools? How do we help communities? How do we help churches do the kind of early intervention that it not only gives the spouse or the survivor help, but does an intervention so that children know that isn't normal and we help them as they become the next generation? I, I mean, this, the cynical side of me says, you know, churches have to believe first that there should be equality. Churches have to believe that that hierarchy of man here and woman here isn't the way life should be. I mean, I, I was raised in an in a, um, evangelical church that believed that my father was the head of the household. So they would have really... But I think they're changing. But not all of them are. Yeah, maybe. But it is becoming a place that women are going. And I think your book, I'll talk about that in a minute, is this going to help be a Me Too movement for yeah. domestic abuse. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I hope so. But I, I am not sure that they're changing. Maybe you, maybe you have more faith in that well, than I, I do. Just, but <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I've been very impressed with the way that some of the imams in the uh, Muslim community have actually taken it on. Yeah, and have to. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. it's not something where you would traditionally see it. And for many women, the only place that they feel they can go is right. the faith-based community. Right. So I would say we need to work together to raise awareness in the faith-based totally. community and to totally. help do the interventions. Uh, totally. And uh, in schools, too, I mean, I think that, um, th th to me, this is the next wave of sort of what our intervention should be is for young people. And, the, you know, the research is saying, like, kids as young as 11, 12 years old. I mean, I have a daughter, I have a daughter who's 11, and... Um, you know, she probably knows more about domestic violence than most 11-year-olds, but still. Because well, you're writing a book. Right, right. I, she mean, actually, I don't want her to know what some no, others no. do. Yeah, she actually said, you know, can you stop telling me about domestic violence, mommy, for a couple of years? I was like, oh, okay, sure. sorry, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think I think we need to to like, sort of pull, pull back the veil of that, that youth somehow are not affected by this or they don't see it. You know, I went around with a domestic violence, what's called a domestic violence high risk detective in Cleveland. So she dealt only in, in the highest risk cases. Um, and we would, we would show up at these homes where someone had, you know, nearly been killed the night before and they were just a wreck and there were kids running around. And um, one girl who was 17 or 18 years old and was in high school and she had, you know, like a scar on her neck. And she said to this cop, well, you know, her boyfriend had been beating her and she didn't want to press charges. And she said, oh, it's just normal. I mean, my dad was the same way. And this detective just sort of got in her face nicely and said, that is all sorts of wrong. That is not normal. And that that message needs to get out because you're you're right. Like your experience with your father and those mood swings, we don't, we, whatever you grow up with is, is normal you to think you. think it's normal. Yeah. And so in some sense, it is the community's responsibility because the family's not going to say that's not normal necessarily. The family's just trying to stay together or, it's trying, you know, whatever. The victim is just trying to stay alive. So um, I think I, I would like to see more programs geared toward younger people. So let's talk about those programs. You talk about this in your book as well. The Violence Against Women Act is not mm -hmm. funded. Well, I don't want to put work. You wrote that. Yeah. But let's talk about the programs that are out there, why they matter, why, do you feel they're being funded enough? I'm handing that to you on a silver platter since you answered that in the book. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, mean, but let's yeah. talk about that a little because yeah. I think it's deeply disturbing. And right now, we are looking at trying to reauthorize the violence against women. That's right. This should be completely apolitical. This should be absolutely apolitical. We are keeping Americans alive and safe. Of course, we should fund this. I, 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 it's stunning to me that, that we haven't. Um, I would like to see it not be in a place where it needed to be reauthorized every five years. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, one of the benefits of having to reauthorize it is that you can actually look yeah, at what the research thanks. is and 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 reprioritize pol pol uh, policies, and that's been that's been really important. Um, I think we, of course, we need more funding. I mean, I think in the book, I can't remember what the stat is, but it, it was like Jeff Bezos could fund this for three hundred years and that's still have millions of dollars. We just don't fund it very much at all. Um, but to me, if, if I could, besides the guns, I would get rid of the guns. Number one, I would get rid of the guns. But if, if I had to say two areas that I would like to see more funding, it would be in programs for young people, girls and boys, and in batterers intervention to try to, to stop the violence before it 
becomes a homicide or before it escalates. To me, those are the two effective ways. And I think what we're doing is funding things like shelters and transitional homes, and we need those. In fact, actually, we're pulling back funding of, I think HUD is pulling back funding of transitional housing. Um, there's a real shortage. I mean, there's a real I, shortage, I, I, yeah. I've been at these shelters. I mean, we were at Safe House on, which is in Washington County in Michigan, with mm. a, uh, Senator Klobuchar on Mm-hmm. Saturday, and they're desperately afraid because the funding is not certain. You know, these groups need certainty. They need certainty, and yeah. They, yeah. And First Step, which is a group in Wayne County, are having a very difficult time finding that tra- and access, which is the, uh, working with the Arab American, I do a lot of work with these different groups mm-hmm. because we need to. Yeah. Um, but identifying this Transitional housing and affordable housing, I think, is one of the biggest issues we have. All right, so here's a dream. I'm going to share a dream I have with you. We don't have this program in this country. I've only heard of it once in one other country. I'm hoping to write about it, and it's not even in the book. But this, I think, sounds fascinating. There's a program I heard about where if um, an abuser is convicted of a domestic violence misdemeanor, um, I think right now the program is all men, he goes to, he moves out of the home, not her, He moves out of the home and goes into a kind of uh, uh, communal living situation for anywhere between four and six months, holds his job, keeps his job, goes to his job during the day, comes back at night and has batterer's intervention, gender education, housekeeping, child care, all those hidden those hidden things that women do all the time. Um, And that's the intervention. That to me sounds amazing. Amazing. I don't know how effective it is. I haven't gone over to this country yet to see but we Which don't have country do they have i know i'm trying to keep it secret so oh. someone doesn't write about it before okay. i do all right um, i'll tell you off the air um but th- to me that sounds incredibly promising because of course connected to this and, and i don't get into this a whole lot in the book but we have a we have a, a real need for prison reform and that you know we don't want to just send guys to jail or send people to jail and and have them melt away and come back out of jail more violent than they were when they went in. So that that sounds like an interest. Doesn't that sound like an interesting program? I mean, I, I think it's. Uh, I think we do need to look at the program again. Yeah. Every situation is different, mm-hmm. so it will work. And how do you know what's the right? And how do you? Let's go to that stigma a little for both the perp- the the abuser and the survivor. Mm-hmm. Is this a Me Too mo- time? Me- I've said that the Me Too movement isn't real, even now as we talk about it here in Washington, because Capitol Hill, the media and Hollywood are in a bubble. And it's not real until the factory floor worker, the waitress, the law partner, the doctor, Ken, are also impacted by it. So I mm-hmm. was really struck when you said that they were all, you were in several reprints already mm-hmm. of this book and how many people wanted to buy the book. Yeah. It is something people don't talk about. They don't yeah. want. It's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. There is a stigma attached. If, um, it, it, and the women do feel that it's a failure. And how did I ever make a poor judgment to get into a relationship with somebody like this to begin with? Sure. And then people worry about their children. I really worry about the children and yeah. what yeah. happens to them. Is do you think that people are more willing to talk about this now? that it's being recognized more. Law enforcement, you told me New York was buying this book. Let's mm-hmm. talk about how we make this more than a bestseller for a week. And it is a thought provoker, so I hope people mm. do read it. Mm. But what what is it? What is Where are we right now as you know, we have this discussion? We talk about the Me Too movement. So for, for several decades, the stat on domestic violence homicide in this country, in the U.S., has been three women a day. Since 2017, and this is the book was already in in print before this came out, but since 2017, that stat is now four. That's a 33 percent increase. I I had someone do the math. I'm really terrible at math. That's a that that is a shocking number, and that's since 2017. I can't I can't help but think that that is a sort of retaliatory stance for the Me Too movement for things that happened in 2017 in this country. Um, And I also think that women are enraged. I think we're mad. I think the Me Too movement has made us mad. I think you're right that it's that it's not um, in in on the factory floor. It's not in 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 restaurants yet or or whatever. Um, 
but it is I you know I'm a I'm a professor at American University and in um, I think it was December of 2017 we were at a faculty meeting there's I don't know 50 or 60 of us and one of the adjunct faculty members a woman stood up and talked about her experience in our department with a professor who had since died and it just opened up this this unbelievable moment of one after another professors sharing these moments with with our male colleagues and like throughout our lives not in in the department and these these are men who are our allies right they're 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 sort of on our side if that if that makes sense and they were shocked to hear about some of these things that we that we all had dealt with for all these years and so I do think that there I, I do think that women's anger is being channeled I think that that we're in a sort of galvanizing political and social moment right now where you know change I think that I think that policy follows social progress I think social progress happens first I mean I look at like the women's suffrage movement or the union movement or the civil rights movement and society was just you know, in despair and angry and, and, and politicized and fractured. And then policies followed those social movements. So I feel like, I'm, I'm not sure, but I feel like we're going to look back on this and see this. And hopefully, you know, the, the policies that people like you are putting forth are going are gonna, to, you know, keep the momentum going into, into our children's futures. That's my hope. So, it, but when we talk about why, why are more people paying attention to this? And, and it may be that the Me Too movement is allowing people, but are economic situations making people more desperate? Um, do we think that the political times are making, or, uh, empowering some more physical abuse? And are more women willing to acknowledge, willing's not the right word, but a lot of people are afraid to say that this is going on, that they have these issues. And, you know, sometimes those bruises, you say no visible bruises, and they're emotional bruises and they're physical bruises, but people will pinch. They'll give those pinches and they'll leave bruises. They know how to abuse somebody without having people. That's one of the things you write about in the book, even on the murder is, that when you go back and you look at the whole situation, people would have seen the signs, but people either don't see the signs or don't want to see the signs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So where are we now? Are people more willing to see the signs, or are we at? Or are I, I just I don't know where where we really are. I know, I know. It's hard to say because it's like, you know, on the one hand. I think if you're the people who are willing to see the signs are the people who are willing to see the signs, right? So I'm in a, you, you know, I end up in a kind of verbal, I don't know, circular argument or something. I do think that there is retaliation um, happening. Are there more incidences of domestic violence? I don't know. I don't know what the research says yet. It's so, it's so new. Do I think that um, our people at the top or our person at the top is adding to a narrative <laughs> where this kind of behavior is acceptable? Yes, I do, and it sickens me. And that's the thing that's making me and others like me angry, right? I'm not the only um, uh, woman journalist who's out there sort of saying, I mean, you know, we've got Rebecca Traister who's write, wrote about Good and Mad, and, you know, it's an incredible book. We've got Rebecca Solnit who is like a gift to this country. And, you know, even I go back to Audre Lorde a lot, Our Silence Will Not Save Us. And so um, I, I think that... that Hopefully, we are we are in a place where we can those of us who are open to those conversations can pass that along. I mean, can can say like we need to create safe spaces for people to be able to tell their stories. You know, I was on Fresh Air a week or two ago, and Terry Gross asked this woman from a, a domestic violence agency what the first thing she recommends people do is, and she said the first thing you have to do is tell your story. The first thing. And I thought, yeah, that's true. You have to voice what's going on because it's only once you articulate it that I think you can begin to hear yourself to some degree. I think it's so important that you're, you know, you're working in Michigan. I'm a Midwesterner, fellow Midwesterners, right? This this can't just happen along the coast. I mean, California is really progressive when it comes to some of their 
their domestic violence policies and laws. But the, you know, these conversations have to be have to move inward. I think, and um, there are some days my glass is half full, and some days it's not. But I'll tell you what the the fact that this book is getting the kind of attention that it's getting nine years ago when I started the research. I thought no one's going to want to read a book on domestic violence, so I have to write Not a book only that's. Read about it, no one's going to want to talk about no it. No one's going to want to talk about it, and so the the very fact that this book is that you and I are here talking is actually I'm probably more hopeful in the last week and a half than I've been in nine years, to be honest. We're, we're as we head towards the end of the interview, we've got a little time left. You talk about sort of the advocates, the heroes that you've met along the way. Why mm-hmm. don't you share some of the work that you've seen and the champions that you think we should know about? Hmm. There's so many. So, um, you know, the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center in Massachusetts was the first group to start the high-risk team movement, and they separate out the high-risk cases from the the sort of lower-level misdemeanor um, and build protections around those, those victims. And one of their successes is not just that they've they have yet to have a single uh, domestic violence homicide since they created this program in 2003, but that only about 9% of their victims have had to go to shelter. They've all been able to stay in their community. And before they had this team, that number was about 90%. So that's been a huge shift. If you can keep someone in their community, it's amazing. Um, you know, there's this detective in Cleveland who I think d- domestic violence high risk detective named Martina Latessa. She's really funny. Um, she she is out there doing the work of 10 people. She goes to victims' homes. She doesn't have them come to where she is, right? So she she tries to sort of eliminate the bureaucracy for them and talk one-on-one, and she's really effective. I mean, she should be, people should watch her for, for how to handle these situations, I think. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's fatality review teams. I've talked about the team in Montana who, um, after Michelle was killed by Rocky, um, looked at, at some of the gaps in the system, and they've closed a bunch. And there's so there's just so many small things. There's a, a prosecutor in San Diego named Casey Gwynn who um, sort of started the evidence-based prosecution movement for domestic violence so that the victims don't have to go to court and face their, face their abusers um, and, and face retaliatory Violence, and he has since then started a program for children, um, children of domestic violence, called Alliance for Hope International, that does fantastic work with domestic violence victims. So there's just there's so so many people out there. So as we near the end of this, what's your message to people about what you've learned about domestic abuse? What you want them to know? Why should they read the book? And what can they do if they care? I know that's a lot, but <laughs> I know I should be writing this down. So the first thing is they should know that even if they are not in the direct sight line of, of a punch, domestic violence affects nearly every social issue we're facing, from homelessness to mass shootings. We haven't even talked about the mass shootings that, in fact, are domestic violence homicide, um, to mental health issues, to uh, issues of addiction. All of these have intersections with domestic violence. So Absolutely. I believe that if we address domestic violence, that's not even to talk about taxpayer costs, right, which is a whole other thing, billions of dollars it costs. Um, I believe if we effectively address domestic violence, we are addressing a lot of these other issues. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that um, to just know that we can do something. That, that to me was a huge takeaway, to know that this wasn't something... That, that was like, oh, well, that just happens, you know, because somebody made a bad choice or because somebody can't control himself. I mean, I had all these sort of myths. I held all these myths, you know. I thought shelter was an adequate response. I thought victims would just leave if things were bad. I thought restraining orders were effective. I thought if someone was violent, they could never become unviolent. And one by one, those myths were exploded in my research, and so I explode them here. But really, I want people to read the book because it's good. It's a good book. It's a page turner. <laughs> you know, we didn't talk about restraining orders and how you keep somebody safe and how they don't work in many 
instances, nor did we talk about strangulation, which you, is there any, I, 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 there are a lot, there's so many good things in this book mm -hmm. and so little time to talk about it. Is there anything that I didn't touch on that you do want to make sure people read when they read this book? Um, I know I do touch on a lot. I really cram a lot in there, but I, I know, and I'm cramming a lot of heck. Yeah, I mean, I, the one, one thing, I just would mention one thing on mass shootings, actually, because we've talked a little bit about guns, and, um, it, you know, Every Town for Gun Research did a, uh, Every Town for Gun <laughs> Safety, I'm sorry, uh, all the oh, words are like fine. jumbled up in my head, did research and found that 54% of mass shootings are domestic violence. And that, you know, that verb, that R, that is so important because, when we look back, we can look back, for example, at the first mass shooting in this country, the University of Texas Tower shooting. Charles Whitman killed all those students. What we forget in that story is that he started the night before by killing his his mother and his wife. Or the um, the sniper in here in, in Washington, D.C., Virginia and Maryland, DMV, John Muhammad. His whole purpose in in those sniper attacks was to eventually kill his his estranged wife, and that was a way for him to cover up, to, to cover his tracks, supposedly. Domestic violence homicide um, is mass shooting more than half the time. And even when it's not, like in the, in the Orlando Pulse nightclub, which I covered for the New Yorker, the trial of the Orlando Pulse nightclub, Omar Mateen had strangulation with his first wife and was never charged with that in the state of Florida. Florida, It's a felony in the state of Florida. He could have been imprisoned for a decade, and he wasn't. So if we address domestic violence, we are addressing, addressing mass shootings, which, of course, is a scourge in America today. So we're almost at the end. So let me ask if you could tell somebody, if they think they are being abused, where can they turn and what can they do? First thing I would do is tell your story to a trusted friend, a coworker, clergy. Um, I would keep a timeline. Uh, I would try to create a timeline of that relationship so that you can get a sense of whether or not it's escalating. And I would go to dangerassessment.org. I would download their apps and I would take that danger assessment. And then the last thing I would do is the National Coalition of Domestic Violence, um, the, they have state coalitions. So every state has a domestic violence coalition. I would contact your local state coalition as well. Rachel, I want to thank you for this interview. I also would tell people that they can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline, yes. whose phone number is 1-800-799-7233. I've really enjoyed talking to you today, though the subject is not one that I enjoy. Yes. But the book is a great book, and may we start a national conversation. And thank you, Debbie. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your work. Thank you.